Welcome to Salvation and Catastrophe, a new YouTube series uh, that will be edited and administrated by me, Konstantinos Travlos, which will cover the events of the Greek-Turkish War from 1919 to 1923 with an extension to 1924 um, on a monthly basis, every month, what happened exactly 100 years ago. The inspiration for the show is obviously the excellent show, the Great War series on YouTube by Indiana, Indiana Nidel and his team of uh, co-workers we did a great job. So essentially I'm picking up where they're ending and covering a specific conflict in the Eastern Mediterranean and aftermath of the peace to end all wars, which in this case did not do that. I am not going to be producing a very professional series. Unfortunately, I am a full-time academic and I'm busy with my teaching and research uh, responsibilities. That's why this is going to be a monthly show rather than a weekly show like The Great War. Um, so this is going to be pretty much an amateur effort. Uh, as things move along, I'll become better at this probably get some nicer props, um, maybe a nicer corner in the room which I could make look into like a studio. Uh, there'll be animations, there'll be maps, but don't expect the kind of cool stuff you got from India. There will be though, one similarity between the Great Sword series and Salvation and Catastrophe and that is the fact that both me and Indy really like our waste coasts. Uh, now, uh, another thing I have to point out, I am not a professional historian by trade. I'm a political scientist. I wanted to be a historian, but let's say higher powers blocked that effort. Uh, but within political science, I tend to do mostly historical, long-term temporal studies of international relations, and I specialize in the study of peace and conflict. So I'm not totally alien to what's going on here. I'm also interested in history from an amateur scholarly point of view. I've authored a couple of short articles for the foreign correspondent. Uh, I am working on an edited academic volume with scholars from the United States of America, Turkey and Greece on the centenary of the onset of the Greek-Turkish War, within which I'm actually working on a chapter on Eleftherios Venizelos and uh, the motivations that led to his decisions that led to this war. Now, uh, what are we going to do in this channel? The minimum I promise to do is to cover chronologically every month the events that happened on that month a hundred years ago. Uh, my intention is to produce videos either in the last week of the current month or the first week of the next month that essentially does a retrospection of everything that happened on that month a hundred years ago. Uh, now, if I have time, if I have support, if I have help, if you guys actually like what I'm trying to do here, which doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna do well, but if you like ultimately what I produce here, there'll be a lot more stuff. I hope to do some specials on personalities that are important to the world, not just the big names like Mustafa Kemal Pasha or Ataturk or Eleftheris Venizelos, but uh, some of the less known protagonists of this conflict. Uh, examples would be, for example, on the Turkish side, uh, Kazim Karabekir Pasha. Uh, in the Greek side, uh, Steriadis, the High Commissioner of Greece in uh, Smyrna slash Izmir, and so on. Also specials on the political situation, on the diplomatic situation, and so on. I will not cover the Franco-Turkish conflict in Cilicia, uh, Kilic uh, as it's known in Turkish, and I will not cover the conflict between the Turkish Nationalist Movement in Anatolia and the First Armenian Republic in depth, so I will probably talk about that. Uh, I will offer you links and ideas about books. There is going to be actually a link that you can find in the description or over here, uh, which leads to a blog page where I have uploaded a number of uh, links to books as well as whole documents if they were publicly available. A couple of things now. There are a lot of people who produce historical shows on YouTube that claim to be objective. 
Uh, the only thing I know about the study of history is that objectivity is impossible. I don't remember exactly where I got that. That is a term uh, quote from an actual historian, either in the foreword of the Habsburg Empire, a new history, or in the foreword of the recent uh, book Liberty and Death about the French Revolution. Uh, objectivity in the study of history is impossible. Anybody who claims to be objective, to use an objective sources, is essentially not understanding history very well. And I'm sorry that a non-professional historian has to point that out, but this isn't me saying this, these are actually historians saying this. But you know what is possible? Honesty. I claim and I promise that I will be honest in my coverage. I will talk about the facts. I will talk about the conflicting interpretation of facts. I'll make sure to try and provide both sides of the story. Actually, as we're going to see here, there's going to be multiple sides of the story. So that's what I can promise you, honesty. Uh, because let's be frank, I'm a Greek living in Istanbul uh, who doesn't know very well Turkish. So me even attempting to claim objectivity would be ridiculous. So I will promise honesty. Now, I can read Greek, English, French, and a couple of Italians. I do not know a lot of Turkish. I apologize for that. Unfortunately, with my work, I did not have time to take Turkish courses. But I have friends and people, some of whom are actual professional historians who are Turks, and they will help with some of the Turkish sources. So rest assured, everybody is going to get a say into this story. Um, let me give you an example of the idea of honesty over here. That's about the naming of the show. Why am I calling it the Greek-Turkish War of 1919-1922? In Turkey, it's known as the Western Front of the Turkish War of Independence. Uh, Batic FSC, Turk Istiklal Harbi, or Batic FSC, Turk Kuturlus Savashi. In Greece, it is known as the Asia Minor Campaign, and much more rarely as the Asia Minor War. Mikrasiatiki Ekstratia, e o Mikrasiatikos Polemos. The reason for this difference in names is that there is a different interpretation of what happened in this era between the two people. For the Turkish uh, nationalist historical point of view, uh, during this conflict, the Turkish nationalist movement was resisting a coordinated imperialist assault against the independence of the Muslim population of Asia Minor, in which Greeks, Armenians, the Caliphate, the Sultan, uh, Kurdish rebels, all were essentially pawns of the great imperialist powers. Uh, England, the United Kingdom back then, France and Italy, who were essentially trying to turn the Ottoman Empire into the equivalent of uh, contemporary Iran, a country of limited sovereignty divided in uh, spheres of influence, essentially a colonial power. Um, historically, uh, Mustafa Kemal uh, Pasha, or Ataturk as he became later well uh, known, uh, said that uh, if the Turks would fail to win this conflict, he wrote this to Kazim Karabekir, I believe, uh, the Turkish soldiers would end up fighting colonial wars for the British throughout the world. Uh, so for the Turkish point of view, the Greek conflict was just part of a major coordinated assault. Uh, and there wasn't really any real Greek reasons. The Greeks were either tricked or bought off to attack the Turks. There were no real intrinsic Greek interests within the area. They were not independent actors. The image, of course, in Greece is completely different. Uh, of course, there are some people on the left, especially on the Communist Party, the older Communist Party, that take that view that the Greek campaign in Asia Minor was an imperialist war. But the mainstream view is that the Greeks uh, were going to Asia Minor in order to protect the livelihood and the property and the lives of the Ottoman Greeks who were at danger 
from the nationalist movement, which was nothing more than a continuation of the policies of the Committee of Union and Progress Party, Itihat Veteraki, also known in Greece as the Comitato. So there was a view that this was a war of liberation, that it was war of independence. And unlike the Turkish view, where the various forces opposed to the nationalist movement were all coordinating very well between them, the Greeks stressed that there was no coordination. The United Kingdom was supportive, but it never really participated in the military conflict in a serious way. It gave money to the Greeks, it gave weapons to the Greeks, but it didn't actually give any Allied troops. And France and Italy were always acting to undermine the Greek position, especially after the November elections. There was no cooperation or coordination with the Armenians. Uh, there was no coordination or cooperation with the Ottoman government, especially under Damat Ferit Pasha. There was no cooperation with the Kurdish tribes and so on. The Greeks essentially were fighting by themselves against a nationalist movement that was supported by at least two one great power, Italy, and the resurgent Soviet power. Here's the thing. As we're going to see from our chronology, both of these interpretations are based on facts. But if you try to build an objective history here, you will be missing the point. Instead, I'm being honest. I can't call this war the Asia Minor campaign because it will completely negate the fact that, yes, indeed, Greece was cooperating with great powers that were seeking uh, economic and power political interests. I can't call this war just the Western Front of the Turkish War of Independence because the reality of the matter is, especially after November, the Greeks were undermined by their supposed allies. They really were not that much supported uh, when it comes to material and economics by the British. And there was never really that much coordination between, let's say, the Greeks and the French in Cilicia or the Greeks and the Armenians. So instead, I use the term the Greek Turkish War. It is the term that is used in the Anglophone International Encyclopedias of Conflict, whether we're talking about the Claude's of War data set or Claude Felter's uh, Encyclopedia of Military Conflict. And it does capture a real element that this was mainly a war between the Greeks and the Turks, not just between the Greek state and the Greek government and the army and forces of the Grand Turkish, uh, the Turkish Grand National Assembly, but also a war between the populations. As we're going to see, there was a lot of killing happening between Greek Adartes, rebels, especially Ottoman Greek refugees returning to Asia Minor to reclaim their properties, and uh, Turkish Muslim uh, Mili Kuvay uh, or Chetes. So it was a broad war. That's why I'm choosing this term. It is not an objective term. It negates part of the story that is acceptable to Greeks and to Turks. But it is a term that I believe is honest. And that is the conflict we're going to cover here. A couple of other things on naming conventions. Wherever possible, I will use a name for cities that uh, were used by both the Greeks and the Turks. So, for example, Smyrna will also be called Izmir. On the other hand, for Istanbul, I will actually use a name that was uh, primarily used by everybody almost back then, which was Constantinople, or in its Ottoman form, Constantinia. Uh, when it comes to the names of uh, Turkish political and military leaders, I am going to primarily use the name that used during the era of the war. Uh, as you all know, uh, Ottoman Muslims gained uh, surnames much later in the First Republican era. So while the first time I introduce a personality, I'll make sure to also point out the surname by which they are known in modern Turkish history. After that, I will focus mostly on using the name they were known back then. So Mustafa Kemal Ataturk will mostly be called Mustafa Kemal Pasha, which is the name he had when he won this great victory. Uh, Ismet in Onu will be called Ismet Pasha, so I cannot promise that I will always stick to this exactly. Uh, again, 
uh, it's not completely unbiased, but I think I'm being honest enough here. So, uh, I'll see you next in the end of October, where we're going to cover the armistice at Mudros or Mondros, plus the resignation of Ottoman Grand Vizier Talat Pasha, and essentially the supposed end of the fighting in World War I. If you like what I'm doing, remember to like the video and subscribe. Until then, stay well. I'm Constantinos Travelos, and this is Salvation and Catastrophe, the web series that covers the Greek-Turkish War of 1919-1922, month by month, a hundred years ago today. In this episode, a hundred years ago, the First World War ends for the Ottoman Empire. The triggering event was the decision of the Bulgarian government to seek an armistice. Let us take a more detailed look. On 20 to 23rd September by the old calendar, 3 to 5 October by the new calendar of 1918, Greek Prime Minister Eleftherios Venizelos gives speeches in Thessaloniki, Salonika, Athens, and the Greek Parliament celebrating the Bulgarian surrender. He stresses that this is a victory in a 900-year-old struggle between Greek and Bulgarian in the Balkans, and how the establishment of a strong Serbia and a weak Bulgaria is key for Greek security. He also notes how the Bulgarian surrender legitimizes his policy and completely proves the stupidity and treasonous character of the policy of King Constantine and his supporters during the 1916-1918 period. In Parliament, meeting for the first time after a seven and a half month recess, he argues that the Entente victory is a victory of moral character over material power. He stresses how the popular will was always in disagreement with the actions of King Constantine. He blames the Constantinist governments for the lack of any secure rewards for Greek participation in the war, but he is confident that the Allies understand that the treason of King Constantine is not the treason of the Greek people. Now, a couple of days later in Istanbul, Constantinople, on the 7th of October 1918, Grand Vizier Sadrazam Talat Pasha meets with the Committee of Union and Progress, or the Itihad Vetera Kijemiyeti parliamentary group, and informs them that he intends to resign. This follows a fact-finding trip to Germany and Bulgaria, from which he concluded that the Central Powers were done for. Uh, the problem with this is that there is no available military force to hold the line at the Maritza Evros River, meaning Istanbul Constantinople was open to occupation by the Entente armies located in East Greek Macedonia and Western, back then Bulgarian still, Thrace. On 9th or 13th, 14th October 1918, depending on your sources, Talat Pasha resigns as Grand Vizier or Sadrazam of the Ottoman Empire. He is replaced by Ahmed Izzet Pasha, later known for Gaj. He is the aide de camp of the, looks of the Sultan Mehmed VI Fahreddin. I would like to take some time and discuss Talat Pasha. Now, he became Grand Vizier in 1917. Before that, he had served as Minister of Interior and Minister of Finance. He was a central member of the Triumvirate that had ruled the Ottoman Empire since the raid at the Sublime Port in 1913. He was a remarkable administrator and one of the founding generation of the Committee of Union and Progress. Uh, he built his position as a party man, despite being expelled for a period in 1908. It was he and his Edirne Andrianople faction that brought into the party the military officers that would lead the 1908 Young Turk Revolution through the vehicle of the Ottoman Freedom Society, Osman Lee Hurriye Gemiyeti. By sheer competence in politics, he was able to build 
a mass party organization in cooperation with Enver Pasha and dominate the Central Committee of the Committee of Union of Progress. Indeed, he was the main architect of that mass political organization and the de facto, as one of my colleagues says, one party state that the CUP controlled. For that power was always tenuous and subject to the vagaries of the coalition politics within the CUP army axis of control. He was also a criminal. Those very same organizational skills were put into effect during the process of population engineering that led to the Armenian genocide and the mass deportation and mass death of Ottoman Greeks. Of all the Committee of Union and Progress leaders, he was unquestionably the one who knew he was sending the Armenians to their deaths. Now, we know this because of our remarkable exchange, noted in the Ottoman parliamentary archives and reported in Fuatundar's Moderni Turkiye Sifersi. I extracted this citation from the Greek version of the book, which is also available in Turkish and French. On July 6, 1914, the Ottoman Greek member of parliament, Emanuel Emanuelidis, called Emanuel Effendi in Ottoman sources, asked the Minister of Interior, Talat Pasha, why were the Muslim refugees from the Balkans resettled in Ottoman Greek communities, which he argued was one of the causes of the prosecution and flight of Ottoman Greeks, and not in areas that were sparsely populated like the Erzor and areas south of Aleppo. Talat Bey, as he was known back then, answered that while it was true that such empty spaces did exist in the empire, it would cost the state 15 to 20 million Ottoman pounds to resettle these refugees. In the absence of such a monetary amount, if the refugees were resettled in these areas, they would starve to death. Ten months later, in 1915, Talat Pasha ordered the initiation of the deportation of the Ottoman Armenian population to exactly such areas. While one could argue whether other members of the Committee of Union of Progress or of the administration understood that they were killing the Armenians by their decisions, or simply, as scholars like Edward Erickson argue, engaging in counterinsurgency warfare, Talal Pasha knew he was sending them to their deaths. The others either shared his goal did not care, did not know, or simply cooperated believing that they were actually serving different goals than the ones that Talat Pasha was. And now this remarkable and criminal man has stepped down, taken with him the other two members of the Triumvirate, Anwar Pasha, who had married into the Ottoman dynasty, and Jamal Pasha, in the hopes that the change in government would lead to more lenient terms by the Entente. There wasn't an attempt to get President Wilson of the United States to mediate by Spain, but it received no response. He was replaced by Mushir, which means Field Marshal Ahmed Izzet Pasha, a non-political military officer and patron of Mustafa Kemal Pasha, who quickly became ineffectual due to suffering from the Spanish flu. Initially, the Sultan wanted to make Grand Vizier Ahmed Tefik Pasha, later known as Okdai, a veteran politician considered loyal to the throne, but his refusal to accept union members of cabinet led him to being unacceptable to the community of union and progress that still dominated politics. Instead, Izzet Pasha created a cabinet including anti-war CUP members, some of which we're going to see were personal friends of Mustafa Kemal Pasha or people who had worked with him. Despite several requests for the war ministry, Kemal himself was not included in the cabinet, but the cabinet was definitely one where his friends had a presence when we compare it to the 1913-1980 CUP cabinets. Izzet Pasha sent General Townshend, captured in 1916 at Kut Alamara, in order to seek terms from the Entente. The British responded positively to the request for terms and sought to exclude their French allies from the negotiations. The Ottoman delegation was headed by Rauf Orbay, the Minister of the Navy, a hero of the First Balkan War, reliable unionist and personal friend of Mustafa Kemal Pasha. He was joined by Lieutenant Colonel Sadullah of the 8th Army Chief of Staff and Rashad Hikmet Bey, Secretary General of the Foreign Office. 
Mehmed VI had tried to get his brother-in-law, Damat, which literally means royal bridegroom, Ferid Pasha, a fanatical enemy of the Unionists since 1913, to participate in the negotiations. But Izzet Pasha persist, resisted, fearing that the political passions would harm the cause of the throne. The British cabinet had empowered Admiral Calthorpe to seek a quick armistice before the French or American governments could interfere. The negotiations began on the 27th October 1918 on the British pre dreadnought battlefield Agamemnon, anchored in the Mudros Mondros port in the Greek island of Lemnos. On 30th October 1918, the armistice of Mudros Mondros was signed between the Ottoman Empire and the British Empire on behalf of the Entente. The terms were first, opening of the Dardanelles and Bosporus and secure access to the Black Sea, Allied occupation of Dardanelles and Bosporus ports. Second, positions of all minefields, torpedo tubes and other obstructions in Turkish waters to be indicated and assistance given to sweep or remove them as may be required. Third, all available information as to mines in the Black Sea to be communicated. Fourth, all Allied prisoners of war and Armenian interned persons and prisoners to be collected in Constantinople and handed over unconditionally to the Allies. Fifth, immediate demobilization of the Turkish army, except for such troops as are required for the surveillance of the frontiers and for the maintenance of internal order. Sixth, surrender of all war vessels in Turkish waters or in waters occupied by Turkey, the ships to be interned in such Turkish ports or ports as may be directed, except such small vessels as are required for police or similar purposes in Turkish territorial waters. 7. The Allies to have the right to occupy any strategic points in the event of any situation arising which threatens the security of the Allies. The Ottoman negotiators got Kalthrop to promise the Grand Vizier and Sultan that no Greek troops will be part of occupation forces. This promise will not be held. 8. Free use by the Allies of ships of all port by Allied ships of all ports and anchorages now in Turkish occupation and denial of their use to the enemy. Similar conditions to apply to Turkish mercantile shipping in Turkish waters for proposals of trade and demobilization of the army. 9. Use of all ship repair facilities at all Turkish ports and arsenals. 10. Allied occupation of the Tarbes Tunnel system, very important for the railway contact between Istanbul and Baghdad. 11. Immediate withdrawal of the Turkish troops from northwest Persia to behind the pre war frontier, which had already been ordered and now will be carried out. Parts of Transcaucasia that have already been ordered to be evacuated by Turkish troops, the remainder is to be evacuated if required by the Allies after they have studied the situation there. 12. Wireless telegraphy and cable stations to be controlled by allies, Turkish government messages expect, accepted. 13. Prohibition to destroy any naval, military or commercial material. 14. Facilities to be given for the purchase of coal and oil fuel and naval material from Turkish sources after the requirements of the country have been met. None of the above material to be exported. 15. Allied officers to be placed on all railways, including such portions of the Trump-Kafkasian railways as are now under Turkish control, which must be placed at the free and complete disposal of the Allied authorities. Due to considerations being given to the needs of the population, Turkey will raise no objection to the occupation of Baku by the Allies. Now, this is very important since Baku was one of the big awards of the Treaty of brest lift fosk for the Ottomans. 16. Surrender of all garrisons in Hejaz, Asir, Yemen, Syria and Mesopotamia to the nearest Allied commander and the withdrawal of troops from Cilicia, except from those necessary to maintain order as will be determined under Clause 5. 17. Surrender of all Turkish officers in Tropolitana and Cyrenaica to the nearest Italian garrison. Turkey guarantees to stop supplies and communication with these officers if they do not obey the order to surrender. So, the Italians are not forgetting the Libyan misadventure. 18. Surrender of all troops occupied in Tripolitana and Xirineica, including Misurata, to the nearest Allied garrison. 
19. All Germans and Austrians enable military and civilian to be evacuated within one month from the Turkish dominions. Those in remote districts to be evacuated as soon after as may be possible. 20. The compliance with such orders as may be conveyed for the disposal of the equipment, arms and ammunition, including transport of that portion of the Turkish army which is demobilized under clause 5. 21. An Allied representative to be attached to the Turkish Ministry of Supplies in order to safeguard Allied interests. This representative is to be furnished with all information necessary for this purpose. 22. Turkish prisoners to be kept at the disposal of the Allied powers. The release of Turkish civilian prisoners over military age to be considered. 23. Obligation on the part of Turkey to seize all relations with the Central Powers. 24. In the case of disorder in the six Armenian vilayets, the Allies reserve to themselves the right to occupy any part of them. And 25. Hostilities between the Allies and Turkey shall cease from noon local time on Thursday, 31st October 1918. In general, as Eric Zürcher notes, the armistice was received in the empire with elation by Ottoman Greeks and Armenians, but also with general signs of relief and hope by Ottoman Muslim elites. If we compare it with the armistice imposed on Russia before brest litovsk or the Treaty of Batum imposed by the Ottomans on the First Armenian Republic, it compares favorably. The empire and dynasty had remained in place. The political system was largely maintained. Compared to Bulgaria, the Ottomans seemed to get a better deal. In general, it was seen at the time as an honorable offer from Victor to Vanquished. On the 31st October 1918, Mustafa Kemal Pasha is made commander-in-chief of the Yildirim army group in Cilicia. Talat Pasha, Enver Pasha, and Jemal Pasha, and four other unionist war leaders flee Istanbul, Constantinople, on a German ship first for the Crimea and from there for Berlin. Some accuse Z. Pasha of facilitating this. At some point in mid-October, Ali Fethi, later Okiar, and Hussein Kadril, plus some other CUP parliamentarians split from the Committee of Union and Progress and form a new party, the Ottoman Liberal People's Party, Osmanli Hurriyet Perver Avam Firkasi. Mustafa Kemal Pasha becomes associated with this party and a co-owner of its paper, Minder. This was the first opposition party in the Ottoman parliament since 1914. Now, I would like to briefly discuss the state of the Ottoman Empire at the time of the armistice. According to the work of Edward Erickson, the Ottoman Empire may have suffered around 1 million permanent wartime military losses between 1914 and 1918, which includes those who died or those who were rendered unable to offer further military service. According to the estimates by Justin McCarthy, the population loss may have hovered around 2 million for the Muslim population. To this, we must add the victims of the Armenian Genocide, which scholars supporting the Turkish interpretation of events place at 600,000, while those supporting the Armenian interpretation of events place on average as high as a million, and the population loss from the ethnic cleansing of Greeks, which in the Karadenis Pontus area some argue amounted to a genocide, which may have cost the Ottoman state 100 to 150,000 to 250,000 lost lives. Whatever numbers you use, the fact remains about one-third of the Armenian population of the Ottoman Empire in 1914 was now dead. The internal Muslim refugees of the war may have amounted to around a million. On a conservative estimate, about a million Ottoman Armenians and Greeks were deportees, and between 100,000 and 300,000 Ottoman Greeks had become refugees. Under the terms of the armistice, these people were to be returned to their homes homes that were now used to alleviate the plight of Muslim refugees from the war and the 410,000 refugees that had fled the Balkan Wars. This would become an issue. Thus, from a pre-war population between 18 and 20 million 
people, the Ottoman Empire had suffered a population loss of around 4 million or about 50 to 20 percent. And yet, the core of the empire in Anatolia Asia Minor had escaped the material depredations of war. 400,000 Muslim refugees from the Caucasus had arrived in the empire during the war years, and while that created a strain on the logistical uh, base of the state, it somehow had ameliorated some of the population loss. While Eastern Anatolia, as seen in the map, the main regions of Armenian habitation had suffered the ravages of the genocide, Armenian insurrections and the Caucasian campaign, and the land south of the Taurus had suffered the ravages of the Mesopotamian and Palestine campaigns. Central and Western Anatolia had suffered population loss, but no major destruction outside of the gallipoli chanakale region. Indeed, at the time of the armistice, according to Edward Erickson, the Empire had around 1,100,000 men under arms. It will take a very long period, lasting to late spring 1919, for this force to be demobilized to 61,000 men. Even then, the new army had impressive logistical and organizational foundations for rapid growth if that was needed. There were cadres and material for forming 20 infantry divisions and 9 army corps. And while demobilized divisions were down to essentially a strength of 1,540 riflemen, 36 machine guns and 8 artillery guns, there were available in reserves about 800,000 rifles, 2,000 machine guns and 945 artillery pieces. At full mobilization, this could furnish an army of at least 250,000 men. This potential and the existence of a ready existing command and control structure, including, importantly, a general staff, will have decisive impact on the Greek-Turkish war. And that brings to an end our coverage of the events of October 1918. The one-party regime that had taken control of the Ottoman Empire in 1913 and had taken it into the First World War seems to be passing from the stage, leaving behind a country that had suffered horrendous losses, but a country still with impressive military potential and an Anatolian reduct, largely untouched by the war and beyond the immediate reach of the Allies. The sources for my information in this episode include Edward Erickson, Order to Die and Ottoman Military Effectiveness in World War I, Justin McCarthy, Muslims and Minorities and Death in Exile, Fuat Dundar, Moderne, Turkiye, Sifrasi, Andrew Mango, Atatürk, Eric Zürcher, The Young Turk Legacy, Stefanos, Ioan Stefano, Lefteriu, Venizelu, Takimena, Volume 2. If you want to learn more about how we got here, I suggest the YouTube series The Great War by Mediacraft and the Ottomans in World War I new series. For more context of the period, see the series Between Two Wars by Time Ghost History. I used Imaginary Sense Teleprotter to help record this episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe. See you next month.